pray. Praise God. So let's just pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful, Lord, for your goodness that's surrounding us right now. Your wonderful presence. Whoever with us, Emmanuel, but you are also your manifest presence with us. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that we can respond to your love through our love for you. Lord, as we go into your word, we pray that uh, our minds uh, are renewed, our hearts are open, our ears uh, are alert. Father, that we, we have the faith to receive this your word. It's your word, Lord, and we believe that it is unctioned, it is anointed, it is empowered to do something different in our lives. For it is not the word of man, but it is your word. So we receive it with gladness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, I, want, I want to encourage you on the series uh, that I have of renewing the, the mind and also um, you know, connected to uh, we are in this world, but not of this world. Amen. You know, both aspects are very, very important. And you know, talk more even about being in this world. We are in this world, amen. So we, we're not, we're not weirdos, you know, strange people. You know, because we become Christian, we born again. You know, we are in this world. So we, we, we talk like everybody else. We, we eat the same food on the table, and amen. Glory be to God. It's not like the day you got saved and the following morning when you woke up, you know, people who live with you didn't say. Who are you? <laughs> Who is this stranger? <laughs> you looked exactly <laughs> the way you always look. Amen. But something inside of you had started to change. Amen. So, so um, it is important to understand that we are, because sometimes if we don't handle the bit of we are in this world, we can become an offense to people and it becomes a hindrance to actually listen to people. I have seen it many times where people have become over spiritual for the lost world. And the lost world has gone, I don't want this. I don't want this. We, we've, we've got to be, uh, you know, in this world, but not of this world. Uh, however, though, that's for um, another message. So I, I want to, I, you know, we've got so many people that are not here today, uh, you know, but, uh, Praise God for the website, amen, and the recording and the everything. They can listen to this if they desire to. So, <clears throat> I want to talk to you about renewing the mind from uh, the Gentile cultural traits, amen. Renewing our minds from the Gentile cultural traits. And, um, uh, you know, we know that one person who was, um, uh, did you want me to use the, the uh, maybe I should use that, um, or should I just carry on, or just carry on, yeah, or just carry on. Um, we know that the one person who was called to minister to the Gentiles was the Apostle Paul, okay, it was a calling uh, from God, uh, given to him by Jesus Christ to reach out to the Gentiles. And we can see that very clearly. Uh, I'll need a few people to, to read uh, some scriptures, some scripture reading machines, amen? Uh, if you can do that for me, that would be great. So let's look at Romans uh, chapter one, uh, verse five and um, verse 13. Uh, if you somebody there, uh, chapter one, verse, uh, verse five. Yeah. Having praised it, uh, somebody read it for me, please. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith amongst all nations for his name. Among who, from five to where, sorry? It's just verse five. Just verse five. Okay. Yes, and then verse 13. Verse 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that often, oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was left um, hither, 
that I might have some fruit amongst you also, even as amongst other Gentiles. Amen. So you can see the emphasis there of Paul uh, stressing the nations. You know, in the, in the, in the, in the New Testament particularly, uh, when you see the word the nations, it's referring to the Gentiles. Amen. So you see Paul being called to the Gentiles. That is emphasizing that point and is eager to go to them. Uh, how about chapter 15, verse 15 and 18 of the same Romans? Try to tag along with the scriptures. You know, this could be your only Bible study, you know. So uh, read the scriptures as, as we preach. Uh, tag along and underline them. Amen. And when you listen to these messages again, you see why you've underlined the scriptures. So Romans chapter 15 verse 15 and 18. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore Whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not loved by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Amen. So we see quite clearly there Paul stressing to us that he's been called to minister to Gentiles. Now there's a bit of a background here you know, uh, why God uh, chose uh, Paul is, is, is theological, but I think, you know, it does prove a bit of a point. You know, Paul was a Jew, okay, and he was properly brought up in a Jewish uh, culture, and he studied Hebrew, okay, all right. However, geographically, Paul was not brought up in the Jewish land. He was brought up in Turkey in a place called Tarsus. So by that, uh, by the nature of his geographical area where he was brought up, Paul learned the Greek culture and the Greek philosophy and the Greek way of, uh, of doing things. He was very knowledgeable of the Greek way of, of living. So that means Paul understood the Gentiles lifestyle. Because Gentiles, one of the cultures that was so uh, dominant upon the Gentiles was the Greek culture. You know, the whole of Turkey, uh, Rome, uh, th those are, you know, Greek, including the whole of Greece, Thessalonica, Colossae, uh, uh, Ephesus is in Turkey. Uh, so it was all uh, Greek culture and philosophy. Uh, of the nations. So, so, but, but Paul, being Jew, he was brought up within the Jewish culture, but in, uh, uh, in a Gentile, uh, in, in, in a Greek uh, environment. So, so it, it does actually, uh, uh, to some extent, we can understand how God would call this man, okay, a saved Jew, to reach out to the Gentiles, even though he wasn't uh, um, a Gentile himself. Because he understood the Gentile culture and the Greek philosophy. He was very well versed, Paul, in the Greek, Greek philosophy. And, uh, you know, so the Gentiles, uh, their culture basically was Greek. That was their main, their, their main culture. They were exposed to it, they were taught into it, and, uh, and, and the whole reason is because they, were, they would not be allowed to learn the, uh, the Jewish culture. They were not clean. Okay? Hebrew was just for the Jews. Anybody else, you know, was not allowed to do that. And that's why, and I think I've said this before, uh, to the Jewish people, there are only two races on this earth. Two races. The Jewish race and everybody else. So all this uh, thing about racism, you know, white on black and black on, on white and Indian on that, this is all, uh, you know, uh, the foreign man things that come up 
to the Jews, they're not bothered about that. They're not bothered about your color or where you've come from. It's either a Jew or you belong to the rest of the nations. Only two races. Okay? And, uh, um, and, 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 and that's, you know, you know the uh, anti-Semitism thing or it's all linked up into all that. Okay? So, 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 so Paul is a Jew and yet called to a people that the Jews consider to be unclean. Now, the Gentiles had a range of, just like it is today, you know, in, in many third world countries, in, in, in India, in, in Africa, you know, you know, in, in Nigeria, for example, has got, you know, uh, you know, some, you know, the top rich people in the world. I think a few of them are Nigerians, or Jets and things like that. There are many, so many rich people in Africa, so many rich people in India, but also you find very poor people. Okay, so it was the same thing with the, the Greek uh, society. It was a whole range of Gentiles. They were they were ranging from uh, from those who are very poor and uneducated. You know, just you know, uh, this this scum of society. For example, the the Samaritan woman, woman at the well. Okay, uh, you know that prostitute. The the low the lower side of people. Okay, the the Canaanite woman. You know. And, and remember, the Jews would call Gentiles dogs, okay? You know, you know, without offense, you know, because of the way they 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 they, they looked at them. They they uh, they pigs, you know, uh, of of no of no use, of no value. That's how they were looked at. And so, you know, to the Canaanite woman who had a son possessed, and and, and Jesus says, I can't give bread. You know, for the sons, the dogs, and then he says, but even the dogs can eat from the clowns. So that kind of lower side of, of, of the Gentiles, but also there was an upper side of the Gentiles, governors, point us by it, you know, rich, powerful, influential in their society, you know. So, so it was a whole range of, so there are people that, and, and the, the Gentiles in Ephesus, for example, they were very wealthy, they were very rich, they were very hardworking people, working with their hands. Uh, all that kind of, uh, of thinking. I'm just to give you a background, and and remember also, you know, you know, uh, remember a few years, a few years ago, just when we started our ministry, I, I did a series on, on on the blessing and the curse. I don't know if some of you remember that. I think we'll do we'll do it again and the altars, and uh, and we talked about the blood of Jesus. You know, you know, you know, the the, the curse that. People pronounce upon themselves. You know, it was the Jews, you know, who arrested Jesus, but they are not the ones that killed him. They handed him over to the Gentiles <coughs> to sentence him and to kill him. And it's the Gentiles who actually said, Oh, may your blood be upon us and our children. You know, one up to this day, the nations of the world, bloodshed. It was a curse that they pronounced upon themselves. And look at the bloodshed in the, in the, in the Middle East and, and things like that. So, so uh, the, the Jews, because the Jews understood, you know, that having the blood of this innocent person, you know, is, is not, it's is, is, is a, is a curse in itself. So they had to hand him over to the people they considered of no, no value to do this stuff and, 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 and sentence this man and that kid him. So they remain out of it. So the Gentiles have got all this kind of stuff in their society going on and, and things like that. So we understand where they are coming from. Now let's look at some of the scriptures that tell us a little bit about these Gentiles. Okay? You know, from, from the you know the writings of Paul. Now we know Paul is called to them. So that's why we see Everything that Paul writes, you know, you know, is, is, is directed at these Gentiles, these Gentile nations that are becoming believers. Okay? So let's look at some, some scriptures. Somebody look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. And see some of the things that we, we pick up from there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and, 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 and verse 2 says, Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb 
idols, even as ye were laid. And some of your virgins who actually use the word, ye know that you are pagans. So another word for Gentiles in the flesh who are not saved are pagans. Paganism. What is paganism? Paganism is basically uh, living a life of uh, 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 many gods, polytheistic people, uh, or godless lives. So this is what Paul is saying here. So it gives us an, an idea of who these people were. They were Gentiles. They were pagans being led astray in dumb idols. And then, and then the, the, other, the other scripture is Galatians chapter 4, verse 8. If we go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 8, just to get, get a flavor of some of the things that Paul is trying to, to look at. You know, how be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. How be it then? When ye knew not God. So these people didn't know God. They were godless people. That's their background, the Gentiles. They were godless people. They were brought up in that environment of godlessness. Because, because the law of Moses could not be given to them. It's only the Jews who understood God. And they were taught that way. But the Gentiles were cut off from that. Because they were not meant to. So they just lived. They had their conscience within them of good and wrong, and um, some of them would sneak, maybe they were, they were put on the outer circles trying to save the Jews who were worshipping, so they understood what's going on, and these Jews are called God, but they were never exposed to a life of relating with God, so they were godless people. And uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, if you just uh, flip a few, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Wherefore remember that ye being in the time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. It says remember before you were in the flesh. So these are people, that's, so we see Paul is trying to address something about their life in the past. Their life was in the flesh. They were flesh people. Uh, the, 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 um, the, the Gentiles. Amen? Amen. And then, and then um, the, the other scripture I wanted us to look at is, um, if you are still in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which given me to you towards you, how that my, by revelation ye may be known unto me the mystery as I foresaw, as I, for, I forewrote in few words. So again he's saying in, in verse 1 and 2, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of justice, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of grace. So that means these people are people that never understood anything in the God's grace. So Paul is like address these things when they've become believers. Again, Ephesians chapter 4, just say, you know, uh, you know, verse 17, Paul says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not after, no, walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. So now he's addressing Gentiles who have become believers. But there's a problem here. These who have become believers still have certain issues. And Paul is trying to tell them, don't walk like the other Gentiles in the vanity, in the futility of, of life. So Gentiles are people who live the vain life. It was all vanity. They were just busy making money, you know, spending it at night and in clubs and things like that. And then they go back and, and work again. They were hardworking people. You know, Ephesus was a busy place, you know, of business and the worldliness and all this kind of stuff. Sports and all this kind of stuff. But all that was, was vain, uh, he's trying to say here. It was futile. Something which is futile is, is wasteful, it's useless. It's fruitless. It's pointless. 
That was their, that was all their life. Can, 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 we, can, we, can we see some of this kind of stuff today? Of course. You know, we, we were out uh, in, in a certain locality and we realized it's very quiet. And we wondered, this is, this is 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, why is this estate so quiet? Many people were in their homes, but we saw a lot of cars parked around, indicating they were at home. So maybe they, they are sleeping, they, there are people that, maybe in that estate, they do a lot of night shifts, and they've come up, they're sleeping, you could see children playing around, but hardly any adults. Or maybe it's just one of those estates where people, it's a Friday night, they, you know, they go, they go clubbing and things like that, now they're sleeping. And then they wake up and they go to work and work again and do the same kind of thing. So that kind of lifestyle. It's a Gentile kind of lifestyle. Okay, so Paul is identifying these things in there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Also, uh, talks about, uh, Paul is addressing one other thing here. To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory, of his ministry among the Gentiles, which is in Christ, in you, the hope of glory. So, Paul again identifies that these people, these Gentiles, have a problem. They don't seem to understand that now they are in the riches of the glory of God. They are real riches. It's not just the riches based on the work that you do and the money you're putting in the bank, but they are, they are riches of His glory. You've got to relax on these things and begin to depend on God. God is rich. This God that you serve is very rich, and His riches are for you. So he's beginning to address things like this as well. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse, um, verse 9, he says, You tend to God from idols. 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1, verse, verse 9. He says, You tend to God from idols, and now you are serving the true God. So this is the background of these people. Okay? They are in church now. <laughs> but their background is they are just coming from serving the life of serving idols. But they are in church. You know, but Paul was patient with them. He understood their problems. And you know, God in his own wisdom, it's no wonder he's called this man. Because this man was a saved Jew who, however, he was living in a, a Greek environment. That's why he persecuted actually Christians. And the same man that God calls. So, so from all the apostles, you know, we can find a better person who's got both of, you know, of, of the cultures. The Hebrew culture and the Greek culture. It was Paul. And therefore, he was able to receive revelations and the in-depth teachings to these uh, Gentiles. So in summary, we can see that the Gentiles, in the flesh, could be characterized as idolatry, lawless, and remember, the reason why the Gentiles were lawless is because the law of Moses could not be applied to them. That's what the Bible says. They were not under that law. That law was only for the Jews. And therefore, if the law does not apply to you, they became lawless. So they had no discipline, because if they have put no conscience, there is nothing to convict them. But you are just left like that. Sometimes we see it, even in the world today. Sometimes, you know, you know, you know, people that have just been left by, and the council just feels the obligation just to look after these people. Give them benefits, support them like this, give them what they want, you know, because somehow they've given up to say, oh, this kind of people, it's all right, just give them what they want, and, uh, you know, keep them a little bit quiet. Whether they are honest and things like that, when they are caught breaking the law and stuff like that, they appear before the magistrate, and the magistrate will say, okay, you know, diminish responsibility, it's all right. But somebody else, the magistrate will not say diminish responsibility. They say, you must understand the law. So you're gonna, we, we are going to convict you. So you see, we see these injustice, injustices even in, 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 in what they like. So Gentiles were left like that. Okay, so they were lawless people. They were immoral people. You know, they, you know, the Gentiles in the flesh, they were faithless, no God. They were deceived, they were religious people. They, were, they had a degraded culture. And, and uh, you can even see some of the emphasis, and this is just from, it's, it's not from my, my, my uh, personal study, I'm just looking at my Bible, which I have here, this, this King James, at the beginning of every book, it summarizes what the emphasis of the book is. 
So I looked at all the all the episodes of Paul to uh, to to to, uh, to the to the churches, and you, you know in the, the Bible says like for to the Romans, the emphasis was on the law of righteousness. Now, you know, trying to teach them to say now you are under this righteousness because these people were coming from these things to summarize. All of a sudden now to be taught to say look, God is saying you are righteous. Didn't we have this problem yesterday when we met the Jehovah's Witnesses? They can't accept. They don't believe. That you know, God would say to them, you, you know, you are righteous. I said, this got nothing to do with you. We stood there for 30 minutes trying to explain. Say, look, God is here and you are here. There's nothing. Oh, I'm trying. I'm hoping to be good. We are trying to hope to be good. I said, I said look, you've got to believe in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Yeah, we, we believe in Jesus. He's, he's our friend or something like that. I said, no, but he's your personal Lord and Savior. Because if you're a personal Lord and Savior, then Jesus says he lives in you. And if he lives in you, when the Father looks at you, he doesn't look at you in perfect imperfections anymore. He looks at the Son who is in him. And that's why he shed his blood. The blood has covered you. You are God's righteousness. They couldn't take it. But you see, this is how the Gentiles were. They came from that background where everybody told them you can never be good. Look at your useless. You are futile. And our Paul is trying to teach the Romans to say, there's now you're under a new law. I know you've been lawless, but there's a law of righteousness now. So, so, so that was the first them. And then to the Corinthians, you see it was about paganism. <laughs> you see, you could understand. There are people that, you know, we had that man that came here last Sunday night. You know, he gets saved and he, if he came back the following Sunday or today, probably physically, we wouldn't see much difference in him. It might take a bit of time. Because this is a person whose body is so used to these kind of things. So these guys are saved now. But Paul is beginning to see some aspects of paganism in their way of thinking. And now they are excited, the church that God is with the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was one church that really flew into this gift of the Holy Spirit. They are very excited. But they begin to misuse them. Because they are trying to connect the manifestation of these gifts with some kind of stuff that they saw in Ephesus there. This is confusion. So he's trying to correct them. So this was their mindset. And then you look at the Galatians. Galatians. Okay, now they've gone back to base their faith on works. Because that's what we're taught to be good, you've got to work hard and, and prove yourself. So he's emphasizing that to them. And then the, the, to the Ephesians, the Ephesians, you know, the, this commentary says they, they could not grasp. They were very rich people, but they could not grasp that their richness now is of the Lord. The inheritance is in Christ, that they are blessed. That they are, they are, they are co heirs of Jesus. Now it's getting difficult for them to understand that concept. You know, and then, and then the, the, to the Philippians, they were generous people. But they lacked unity. It was a problem of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, non-legends. Now, some of these I'm talking about, they are there in church today. In born again, there is many churches. You know, there was no unity. They could not work together. They could not, uh, uh, you know, there were factions between them. So Paul is trying to get them to say, let me thank you, Philippians, for your generosity. You are really wonderful. You are good. But <laughs> you've got to remove these factions now. You are, and be of the same love, the same mind, the same spirit. This is how it works. And you'll be more complete. And then we have the Colossians. You know, the, Korean, the Colossians, you know, started off very well, but then they became, uh, no, that's not the Colossians, that's the Thessalonians, but the Colossians, their problem was, they could not understand the concept of Christ now is the head. You are connected to him. You are in him. Just like the Jews felt, you know, they told you that they are connected to God. So you Gentiles now as well, you are connected to Christ directly. And they found that very difficult. To accept. The Thessalonians, the problem they have the Thessalonians is that they allowed the philosophy to overtake the seeds of faith in them. They started off very, very well, but then philosophers, the Greek philosophers, came and confused them in Second Thessalonians. And they started now doubting, and um, well, maybe, you know, because of the how they were brought up. So, the effect of the past, beloved, 
traditions and cultures, etc., they do foster and shape our lives. It's a force that we should not uh, underestimate. A lot of our behavior, a lot of our uh, the way we 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 relate to the word of God has got a lot to do with our past, our cultures, our traditions. I'm talking about Christians because these were believers. They foster the way the way we think, our words and our actions, our past, our culture. There are many times when even in this church we do see we sing certain songs. And I'm reminded of the times I was in the country, setting as an auto boy. You know, we just sing, you know, you know, we just sing one song, you know, hey, God is so good. God. And then it takes me my it takes my, my, my mind to the time when I, I was an altar boy. And we sing in songs like that. You see what I mean? Because it was part of the became like a culture, a tradition formed in me. Now I've come to Christ, I've got to have my mind renewed from those things. So don't underestimate the past. None of us was born, born again. Are you together? When the waters broke, <laughs> your mom's waters broke and we came out, none of us was born, born again. We are all people in iniquity and we are in this world. And remember the teaching about being in this world. In this world means the world has got forces that are trying to constrain us, to constrain us, control us, so we are subject to these things. So if we are going now to be in this world, but be out of this world, we need to have our mind renewed. Otherwise we wallow into these past effects. Okay? So you see that the served Gentiles had strongholds that Paul was trying to deal with. Amen. Strongholds. Now, now in the charismatic church today, when you talk about strongholds, we're always thinking about the people that are not saved. We're talking about the people that are being, you know, you know, thrown up and down by demons and things like that. No. Strongholds are cultural, traditional things that we've been brought up in, we've been taught in the past, and they have shaped a certain behavior in our lives, and you don't even realize it. And it's robbing the full inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. We must deal with these things. It, it will be pretense to say, you know, we, are, we are being admonished here about, I didn't listen to the whole thing, we are being admonished about gossip. It will be pretense to say there is no gossip in the body of Christ. It is a gossip. And the people that are into this are people that have at least gossip problem. Even before they became Christians. They need to have their mind renewed against this stronghold. It is a stronghold. Amen? A stronghold is anything that locks you down. It's a safe. You know a safe where you put money? Nothing can get in there. These are walls that have been, you know, built around us. These are strongholds. And the Bible says we must break them. And that's what Paul was trying to emphasize to Gentiles. These things I'm beginning to see in the church, they have come from your background. And they are strongholds. You must realize they are strongholds. And we have to deal with them. They are strongholds in the body of Christ today. They lock us down. You know, you know, in the book of Luke, Jesus is talking about the strong man. What does the strong man do? The strong man does his house. He secures his house. But then Jesus says, but when the stronger man comes, he, he binds that strong man to set the captives free. So these strongholds that have, have locked the house are, are these things from our, from our background. So don't underestimate the effect of the past. Matthew chapter 15 verse 6 says, the traditions of men have done what? have made the word of God of what? Of no effect. Matthew 15 verse 6. The traditions of man make the word of God of no effect. Never you underestimate some traditions you've gone through. 
Hallelujah. That's why I've got this in your mind from the Gentile cultural threats. Glory be to God. So in the point of Christ today, we may be looking good, but we're locked down by some of these strongholds. So don't underestimate them. Now I like this. If it's in chapter 2, verse 1 and 3, let's just look at that. There's one word there that we should not always read over very quickly. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 3. Verse 1 through 3. And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We must understand the past there. Uh, it is great to see who we are now. We've been quickened. But Paul is also wanting to mention where they've come from. He didn't just say you've been quickened. He's reminding them that you've been quickened from something. From a life of day being dead in your trespasses. He's not putting an emphasis on that, but it's, it's something to, to, to not bypass either. And then he goes on to say, where in, where in, in time past, he walked according to the cause of this world. Who did? These Gentiles, who are now believers. They had the life they walked in before. And Paul is just trying to remind them of that. So they understand how to deal with these things. According to the prince of this world, according to the prince that now worketh in the children of disobedience, not you now, but... You once walked into this life. So be careful. Then look at verse 13. Among whom also we had our conversation in time past, in the last of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as, as, as others. Not that vessel. Whereby ye also formerly walked in these things. So you don't underestimate the things that you formerly walked in. When you look at your life and you, look, you begin to look at certain patterns, certain traits, they seem to be repeating themselves over the years. The Gentiles had that problem. It calls for the renewing of the mind. Because there are things that have shaped us. There are things that have fostered certain habits in us. And therefore, we must deal with them. In Matthew chapter 5, 47, Jesus talks about the minds us about the Gentiles. He says, hey, don't you only greet those who are brothers to you, like the Gentiles do. Have you ever seen this in church? Matthew chapter 5, 47. There is segregation in church. Certain people can't shake hands with somebody else. They can't talk to somebody else. Jesus says that's the Gentile life. There are things that were happening before you became Christians. Now you are Christians, you can't do these things anymore. Amen. I wish many people were here today. I hope they will be able to listen to this. These things are there. I hope the way you sit in the church has got nothing to do with this kind of stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why do you want to sit there, brother? <laughs> no, it was because of the keyboard, isn't it? <laughs> because you don't want to sit next to somebody where you know that person. I know that person sits there, so I, I, I'll, I'll take the, the seat, the fairest seat away from them. Jesus says that's the life of Gentiles. Critical spirit, pride. Jesus wants it in Matthew 6 verse 7. He says, when you pray, don't pray like the Gentiles. Don't, don't, don't look at yourselves as the most holy. Others are not. There's something wrong with them. But only you, nothing is wrong with you. It's a Gentile life. And people who do these things, when you look, we sit down and talk with them, you realize that even in the world, that was a predominant feature about them. They have not renewed their mind over these things. They have not recognized it's a stronghold that needs to be cast down. Now that 
they are believers. We need to cast down these things. We have authority. Hallelujah. You can read Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, verse 1 up to 10. It talks about those stuff, you know, of, of, of the flesh. Fornication, lying, slandering, talking against the brother and the sister and things like that. We just make them look a bit more spiritual, but they're strongholds. It's what they are. We've just added a bit of spiritual jargon to it. No, it's not gossip. I'm just trying to tell you this and this. Look, what do you want me to do with this information? What do you want me to do with it? I don't want any information that I can't process or I can't utilize. So these things are in there. So let's not be holier than thou. We have strongholds that we need to work on continuously. The Bible says by the renewing of the mind, transformation through the knowledge of God. The renewing of the mind is a continuous thing. Because we are in this world. So what do we do in conclusion? With all these things I've talked about. First, Second Corinthians chapter 10. This is what I was talking about with, with, with uh, uh, I was talking about with uh, considering the, um, the strongholds. Paul says, we must cast down these things. So next time you hear the word stronghold, don't, don't think about demons. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, from verse 3 to 5. You can read the whole chapter if you want. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh. Now he's telling the Corinthians. You know the problem that I thought about the Corinthians? Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Many times when we read that intercessors, we, we infer that people are not in Christ. No, but Paul is addressing the, the, the strongholds, the, the traits that are still in these saved Gentiles. And he says now we must begin to pull them down, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing to captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And when Paul says we, he says we the apostles. We do these things. Now you don't have to be an apostle because the Bible says each and every of us has got an apostolic ministry. We are all apostles. An apostle is somebody who simply sent. We are all sent. We all have an apostolic anointing. So when we begin to tear down these strongholds, you are simply stepping into apostolic anointing. When you begin to prophesy, you are stepping into your prophetic anointing. When you begin to teach, you are stepping into your teaching anointing. So when you see these traits begin to take over your life, you lock down by them. Say, God, Father God, I, I trigger the apostolic place upon my life. And I tear these things down. I cast them down. He says, we, the apostles, we tear these things down. Because that's what they're meant to be. That's the grace. That's that's what that's that's what the grace that is meant to tear these things down. So we must tear them down. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. We must bring them down. Don't pacify these traits. Don't spiritualize them. If they are wrong, they're wrong. Don't spiritualize these strongholds. Don't pacify them. Don't cuddle them. Don't entertain them. The Bible says destroy them. Cast them down. Are we together? Yes. Hallelujah. We must cast them down. How? By the apostolic anointing that we have. By the spirit of God. The authority that we now have. Now you Gentiles one Christ Jesus. You can begin to use this new authority that you have. To begin to change your way of life. Yes. You can do it. That's what Paul is trying to say. This is the process of renewing our mind. Possess or po possess or oppressed. Did you know that you know one of the other problems that we have in the church today in the charismatics is this you know denial that we can't be oppressed. You can't be oppressed. What you can't be is that you can't be possessed. 
Because the Bible says when you become a Christian, Jesus takes a boat with you. So, 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 your, your spirit is now possessed by Jesus. And there's nothing else that can come in the space that is possessed. The law of physics works the same way. The Archimedes principle works the same way. A space that has been filled cannot be occupied by another molecule. It can't. So you can only be possessed by demons if you're empty of Christ. But you can be oppressed. Why? Because oppression comes to the mind and to the body. Sickness is an oppression. Do Christians get sick? They do. Why? Because infirmity is a spirit of oppression. So when your body feels unwell, it does not mean that your spirit is unwell. No. It's your body. Remember what we taught? A, 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 a human being is a spirit that has a soul and lives in a body. Out of these three, it's only a spirit that is generated. Your mind and your body are not saved. And your body will never be saved. But your mind can be renewed continuously by the knowledge of God. But your spirit is saved. So now you have a battle to bring your body under subjection. So oppression can occur. Jesus was saying, uh, the, 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 in Acts chapter 10, verse 13, Jesus went about healing all who were oppressed. These were believers. Believers were among those people. So we can be oppressed. But we have authority when we are judged by these things. Hallelujah. So we must understand that. You see, if, if this is summer, and this is the time we get all these insects trying to get into houses, you know, it can get very bad. If, if your house, Brother Mike, gets infected by bad, bad insects and stuff like that, so you call these guys from the environmental agents or whatever to come and spread. Now when they come to your house, you say, do they go, oh, Brother Mike, <laughs> or oh, Brother Mike, you don't spread the resident. You spread a house. It's the same thing. Because you are not infected by these things. You can't be. It's the house that's being oppressed. So they clean the house. They spread the house. It's the same thing with us. We are, you are like the spirit, but the body is what can be infected. And you take authority. If they begin to spray you, there's something wrong with those guys. <laughs> so, oh, no, no, no. It's, it's the house that has been infected. So, we, we, we must understand these things. Then the last thing that we must do apart from casting them down is what we are praying about now. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16 and 26 says, We must possess, now I pray, that you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now read the rest of the chapter, the, the verse about that. It's not a revelation now to, to become a bit, oh, you know, one eye closed and, and one eye open, looking and reading into other people's lives. No. This revelation, let's read that scripture. It's about you and your mind begin to understand the riches of inheritance. It's about you. The you in your mind. All get these revelations about other people. That's a spirit of knowledge. It's something else. But if your mind is going to be renewed, we must get this revelation. The new, the, the Gentiles needed this revelation. Hallelujah. Now I pray. He says, I never cease to pray for you. That you will receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. To do what? Somebody read through. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Hallelujah. The foundation is in the knowledge of Him, getting to know God even more. Hallelujah. So don't underestimate your past. When you begin to see them with these traits, they are strongholds. I know it's a way that we don't like, but they are strongholds. And Paul had to say, as said, as, as to us, says, when I come to you, we, the apostles, we are going to cast down these imaginations, these strongholds, break them down. Hallelujah. Break them down. Glory be to God. You know, there are three enemies 
that we face. I won't go into that in detail. Three elements. One, First Peter chapter 5, it says, this is not in notes, it says, your adversary, the devil. So the scripture tells us clearly who the enemy is. The devil, that's one enemy. But also there's another enemy, the enemy without, which is the world. The Bible says, don't you know that being, being, being a, a friend to the world is a limit with God? We shouldn't be friends to the world. We are in this world, but not of this world. Being friendly to the world is an enmity with God. Why? Because the world is an enemy of God. So that's the enemy without. But there's a third enemy. The enemy within. The mind. And this is, this is the one, one tough enemy. The devil is no issue. One of the first things Jesus gave the disciples was authority to cast out devils. So devils really aren't, aren't, aren't a big thing. We sometimes we ascribe to the devil what you shouldn't. Oh, this devil is wrecking havoc in this city. Oh, this devil is wrecking havoc in this house. Oh, this devil, this devil. Jesus said, you have power to cast out devils. So the devil is an enemy. He's under our feet. The world, what are you doing with the world? Paul says to the Corinthians, come out from among them. Another enemy them. If you keep going back to them, you just become like them. Decide, come out from among them. Change your friends. Stop some of those areas you go to. You deal with that enemy. But the enemy that is the church, stopping us from the riches of his inheritance, is the renewing of the mind. The enemy within. And Paul himself wrote about that. In his, he, you know, he, he had the struggle between his pre-conversion and his post-conversion. He says, there's something in me that is telling me I shouldn't do this. But this flesh, have you read that in Romans? Romans chapter 7, I suppose. But this flesh, somehow is just wanting me to. And he spent two-thirds of the New Testament writing about this enemy, the living of the mind. Just that to our faith. The new in our mind from the Gentile cultural traits. We must cast them down. We must pray for the speed of the nation and the wisdom. We win the battle. That's a good thing. Amen. Mm -hmm. But it's a continuous battle that we have. In knowing our mind. Let me just pray for you and then we can go. Because I've got you somewhere. Just lift your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Lord, we give you praise. You, Father, we are so grateful, first and for all us, that we are no longer the Gentiles in the flesh. We are now the Gentiles who believe. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So we are no longer under the law, mm -hmm. but now we are under righteousness. Mm -hmm. And we have been given power and authority. We can take on the apostolic grace and cast down any imagination, any thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. So Father, thank you that we can receive also the spirit of wisdom and revelation to now understand the new things of this life. And in the light of these things, we can identify the Gentile cultural traits and we can deal with them. So Father, I pray like you prayed over these your people right now. Each and every one of them, mighty God, may they, by faith, take on the apostolic anointing and begin to break down, destroy any stronghold, any lockdown in their lives that has persisted, that has no card, that has created some kind of a pattern that they will not accept it, but they will reject it and they declare 
in the name of Jesus that he's got no control over their lives and that they set free from it they walk away from it father thank you that they have victory over the works of the flesh over the control of the forces of this world that they are linked away they are separated from the past philosophies cultures traditions father in jesus name may they begin to experience this fullness of the greatness of your power to them who believe in the name of jesus father i give you praise and the glory for the victory in Jesus name